everybody. Welcome back to 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church out of Tampa, Florida. My name is Joel Eason. I serve as the senior pastor here at Bridgeway. We really are excited that you're with us. If uh, possibly you're a regular around here and you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please make sure that you do so. And if you're new, we'd love to have you do the same, but we'd also love to have you check out a number of our other studies that we have. Uh, we call this 316 because we're anchored into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We always want to try and take time to study the scripture because all scripture has been given us to us from the Lord, and it's profitable and useful in our lives for so many different things, things like correcting and for teaching and for uh, being trained in righteousness. And uh, so here at 316, we like to try and do a walkthrough uh, verse by verse where we can. Sometimes we have to kind of paraphrase and uh, kind of take things in some summary. And uh, you're finding us in the book of Luke. We're in this study where we're going through uh, the gospel of Luke. And for the year of 2024, we're walking through all of the gospels. We've completed Matthew. We've completed Mark. And uh, we're coming to the tail end of the Gospel of Luke. We find ourselves only with one more session after this one. And uh, then following that, we'll be headed towards uh, the book of uh, John. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hop over to our look. And uh, so we find ourselves in what's commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse. So we can uh, parallel often from the book of Luke, the book of Mark, the book of Matthew. They're often referred to as the synoptic gospels, being there's a commonality that you'll find in the three. Uh, the book of John or the gospel of John has uh, its own unique elements, and we'll lean on that in a couple of weeks when we jump into it. Um, but uh, we find ourselves in the, the last week of Jesus' life. It is just before Passover. He has come out of the temple. The disciples are um, enamored by uh, what they're seeing in the temple. We'll talk a little bit about that and possibly why they were so enamored. And uh, Jesus is going to give an explanation of end-time events. And the reason it's called the Olivet Discourse is because he is going to be standing somewhere upon the Mount of Olives as he gives this full teaching uh, or discourse as to how things are to unfold. We read in best detail out of Matthew chapter 24 and 25, but we also have highlights in Mark 13 and in Luke 21. And uh, so that's where we're finding ourselves. I'll just remind you the way that uh, chapter uh, 18 had finished coming into, uh, or I should say chapter 20 had finished coming into this next uh, run, is that uh, Jesus had been watching in the temple, he had been discoursing. We, we looked at the temple itself uh, last week, and he would have been most likely in what was called the women's quarter. And all that is, um, all, all that should be distinct about that is that women were allowed there. It wasn't for women only, but it's a part of the temple mount that women were allowed as well. There's a gate right before that goes into what was called the priest's area where men were allowed, only men. And Jesus is most likely addressing the Pharisees in that in that kind of quarter. And he's going to make note of some of the offerings that people were giving. He's going to speak about a woman who was given out of her poverty. But then the disciples and Jesus are going to leave the temple. And that's where we're picking up. They have left the temple. And it says some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But, Je but Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, let's, uh, let's uh, zero in on something here. Um, the temple has different phases. It, over in the Old, Tem Old Testament, you had the original temple built by Solomon. We know that that temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar uh, in the approximate year of 586 B.C. 
We know that the Jewish people are going to return following exile. We get into a number of the tail end of the minor prophets prophesying about this. We know that Zerubbabel is going to be responsible for building the temple. This is also the time period of Ezra. Nehemiah will follow with the rebuilding of the wall. Um, but there would come a point that the temple, that second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, will be modified and approved by Herod. So King Herod is going to begin renovations uh, on that second temple, probably around 20 BC is what scholars estimate. And it will not be completed until 64 AD. So you have a uh, over 80 year time period of the work on the temple being carried out. Now that's going to go way beyond even Herod's life. Herod is going to die way before any of this is completed, but the work will carry on originally from his sons and then just the work uh, that would have carried on. But I want you to zero in on the Jewish custom that there were three pilgrimage feasts uh, where people would journey to Jerusalem, at least one male uh, representative of the family, if not all the males that could come, um, and Passover was one of them. So the majority of the Jewish people did not live in Jerusalem. So they would be coming into Jerusalem for these feasts, and specifically Passover time. And if they're renovations of great grandeur, then it's most likely that when the disciples would come into Jerusalem, the temple had new improvements that they had yet to see. So they are remarking about how amazing some of these renovations are. And I leaned on some of that in our last study where we looked at the temple. We talked about some of the dynamics there. Um, but it would make sense that they are enamored by it. But Jesus is not enamored by these renovations at all. He's not impressed by it. Because spiritually he's saying that all of these stones are going to be cast down spiritually. Uh, we talked about the connection all the way to the book of Leviticus and mildew in the house, um, Le uh, Leviticus chapter 14. But we also uh, have to pay attention to the natural side, and that is the natural side is that in AD 70, Rome is going to destroy the temple once again. And so Jesus is talking natural that the destruction is coming, but also he is identifying spiritually more so in his body. So from that, coming out to the Mount of Olives, teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? That's a question that we still ask to this day. We ask, when are things going to happen? When Jesus says something is to unfold in our lives or in the world, we ask, well, when? And so that's a common question that the disciples ask, when and what will be the signs that we're watching this happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? And this is what sets up what is called the Olivet Discourse, the explanation of end time events. And he replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. So it'll look like it's getting very, very arduous and bad. And then he begins to unfold a number of those details. Now, to give this uh, study here, it's due time for us to be able to complete, you know, in a, in a manner that, that warrants this study. Uh, we can't unpack all of, all of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, I will put two links at the bottom of this description uh, for this talk. And, and you'll find it, those links to a standalone talk that we did in 2023 called Is This the End? And then there will also be a link to a series that we did called The End, where we went through uh, the entire book of Revelation. We went through the prophecies of Daniel. We pulled into Ezekiel. We pulled into the prophets, the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, 25, and the book of Revelation. And so if you'd like to go through this in detail, maybe the, that series or that individual talk will be of help. What you will find is um, this 
componentry that there will be an escalation of deception. There will be nations rising against nations. There will be all kinds of natural disasters from famines and earthquakes. There will be persecution that breaks out upon people. And uh, it'll be to the degree and the severity that the world has never seen. Now, the book of Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 identifies this as the time of Jacob's trouble or Jacob's suffering. And we know from the Old Testament that the name Jacob was changed to Israel, and that's where we get Israelites. We know that there is a highlighting of the persecution that will happen to the Israelites or the Jewish people. Um, that is not to discredit that it'll be uh, persecution and tribulation and end times for the entire world, but I think, uh, along with a number of better scholars than myself, uh, that the end times is zeroed on Israel. The tip of the spear certainly will be the Jewish people. And we'll find that not only in the Olivet Discourse, we find that through the prophets and we find it even in Revelation. Uh, but in Jesus' words, he says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, tip of the spear. Jerusalem is at the center point of it all. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea, which is just the region north of Jerusalem, uh, let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city, for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Now, for us in the U.S., we might not understand the geography of this, and there's lots of layers to that set of statements, uh, but there's no getting around that that set of statements does have geography involved. If that were to be Tampa and Florida and the southern region, we would understand the geography of it. Jerusalem is at the southern part of Judea, Judea is part of the Jewish context that comes up. Then you get into Samaria, what follows Samaria is Galilee, and uh, this is happening in Israel. Now, it'll go on to depict that there is greater destruction that will come. There is widespread, not just national, but there is global death and there are global disasters. We're able to pull from the book of Revelation and from some of the prophets that we highlight that these three things will be part of what's called tribulation or part of the end times as Jesus is defining. It'll culminate with the coming of the Lord, the second coming that uh, the prophet Zechariah talks about that we see in the book of Revelation. And Jesus is very clear at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power, great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That the completion of those things is to come into fulfillment. And, um, and then from this, he's going to give a parable. Um, once again, we can lean into Matthew chapter 24 and 25 as he's transitioning into the parable. <clears throat> he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Now, once again, I've made my, my case in the study of Matthew uh, 24, 25. I made my case when we did Mark chapter 13. I hold that the fig tree of this parable is in fact Israel. I did not originate that idea. Scholars way better than myself uh, point to the fig tree representing Israel. That is not to say that that is universally embraced. There are a number of scholars that don't think that the fig tree necessarily represents Israel, that it's just more depictive of the change of time. I think it is pointing to Israel and that Israel is what you watch as things change within Israel and towards Israel. You know that these things are closing in and soon to unfold. And so from that, you say, what do we take? 
how do we respond to this? Well, the whole Olivet discourse comes to this kind of conclusion point of be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So there is this encouragement, there is this exhortation, this command to be aware and to be ready. The, w the way that uh, we read about it over in Matthew is uh, he'll give parables. He'll give the parable of these ten virgins and uh, they're waiting. That's how they're defined. But they're waiting for a bridegroom to come, for a wedding to take place. And uh, they have these lamps and uh, because he's long in coming, uh, they are, uh, their, their, their light, their flame starts to go out <clears throat> and they are not ready. And so there's an exhortation uh, to being watchful and to remaining ready. And, um, and so for us, you know, we pull away from watching what's going on in the world. We never want to be, uh, we, we never want to become where we're the ones defining years or dates. The Lord's going to come such and such year. People have tried that for literally centuries and it has been very ineffective um it's been destructive even um at the same time we don't want to bury our head in the sand and say okay we're not going to watch what's going on in the world and we want to be naive so the encouragement is to be aware and to live ready to live like he might come today not out of fear but out of honor out of glory to his name and from that um it's going to begin to turn and it says each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called Mount, the Mount of Olives and all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. Now, now let me just kind of lean into something here because this starts to transition to chapter 22. Um, I, I think Luke includes this uh, because it's very depictive of Jesus' accessibility, Jesus' visibility in the Passover week, and the growing response of the people. Now, I'm going to push on that in just a second. People are attending to him. Once again, let's just think practically. We can speculate a little. We want to always guard against too much, you know, speculation on things. But we know for a fact that uh, not all the Jewish people lived in Jerusalem. In fact, the higher percentage did not. And so not everyone would have been in the territories that Jesus frequented regularly. There may even be people within the, the Jerusalem scope now uh, who had traveled to Jerusalem, maybe who had never heard him or had only heard about him or maybe had witnessed him on one occasion by making a special trip to Galilee to behold this one that so much accolades are made towards. There, there's a lot there that people are gathering with great inquiry around Jesus as to, not just to learn, but is he the Messiah? And we're going to see that as we kind of develop further into chapter 22. It says, now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. Pause. It'd be one thing if it stopped right there. They wanted to get rid of him because he's a nuisance. But Luke includes, for they were afraid of the people. Now, why are they afraid of the people? They're afraid of the people because how the collective population was beginning to see Jesus. And if the collective population was beginning to see Jesus as the Messiah, well, that posed a lot of problems for them. For instance, we've talked about this before in different environments, but the common Jewish perspective of the Messiah and his appearing and we might call it eschatology, end times, how things are to unfold at the end. The framework of Jewish ancient eschatology was very simple. The Jewish people will suffer. The Messiah will appear. 
He will take away the suffering of the people, and he will handle those who caused his, their suffering. Number four, he will establish his rulership. So if he is the Messiah, the disciples, the people following, the people who are just discovering him, all if think if he is the Messiah, we have suffered, we have called out to God, and he is appearing and then what would happen next is he is going to eliminate their suffering and those who have caused the suffering, and he is going to establish his rulership. So the Pharisees are fearful of the people who are going to try and make him king. For instance, there are a couple passages in the Gospels in which Jesus heals or does a miracle, and then he will disappear from them because the scripture says, for they wanted to make him king. If he's the Messiah and he's ending suffering, then it's time for his rulership. That's also why the disciples would come into Jerusalem with Jesus the Passover week and argue about who's greatest because they thought he's coming to establish his rulership. So Satan is going to assist the Pharisees here. It says, then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests, the officers, and the officers of the temple guard. We'll talk about the temple guard in a second, and discuss with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. So that's its own message right there. When your enemy is delighted and is willing to pay you for what you're going to do, he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. This is interesting, and it's not without merit. When no crowd was present. Once again, if people are wanting to make Jesus the, the, the ruler, the, the, the messianic ruler, not just Messiah as we understand, um, but if he is, they want to almost force his hand to kingship, then any of these kind of efforts to stop him, silence him, and in the Pharisees and religious leaders of that day to eliminate him, they're going to have to do it without people around, at least initially. So what ends up kind of being interesting to me is these four things. While all this is playing out, you see sovereign purpose, you see Satan manipulating, you see some people who are staying alert and ready, and then you see some people who have become complicit. Like in, in the story of Jesus being handed over, you see all four of these components of the sovereign purpose of God, Satan's manipulation, some who are alert and ready, some who are complicit. That still plays out to this day. It plays out in your life. It plays out in my life that... The Lord has purposes for your life, and the Lord has purposes for my life. And still, the enemy will attempt to manipulate you and attempt to attack you, distract you, uh, defeat you, discourage you. And he will attempt to manipulate the situation. And sometimes when those two things, the sovereign purposes of God and Satan trying to manipulate just like he did with Judas, some people stay alert and ready and some people become complicit to the attack or the destruction, distraction, discouragement, what have you. And uh, so I just want to pause right here and say, for you, you've got purpose behind your name. God has a purpose for your life. And that does not mean that the enemy is not going to try and stop it, distract you, and discourage you. Do not become complice complicit to the to the manipulation. Don't become complicit to the distractions. Stay alert. Stay ready. Stay serving the Lord. From that, we come into uh, the, the Last Supper in verse 7 through 38. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And then we're going to read about all the details of it. We're going to kind of skip over that. Uh, you can read it in further detail. Verses 8 through 13 uh, Peter and John are going to be assigned to head up the preparation. Verse 14 through 23 is going to be the actual Passover meal. He takes the bread. He takes the cup. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 24, 
he's going to give some instruction that the di disciples totally didn't understand uh, what he meant, but he'll give an explanation for a latter point for them to understand later. And uh, then in verse 31 through 34, Jesus is going to tell Peter, Satan has targeted you. He's asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you are recovered, when you are reestablished, he said, I want you to strengthen your brothers. Now I come to verse 24 and this is so easily overlooked from the Passover meal, the last supper, you know, with all the paintings and all the fame that is drawn to that moment, that a dispute <laughs> arose among them as to who was the greatest. That the disciples are still arguing with one another. Who's the greatest? Once again, I would contend the reason that they could even think in that line was because of the Jewish eschatology of that day. That in their mind, they saw no other conclusion other than Jesus establishes his rule. And part of my backing up on that or the support of that is, let's say, following his resurrection in the book of Acts chapter 1 before he ascends to heaven. What did the disciples ask him? Are you at this time going to establish your rule? That's part of Jewish eschatology. But Jesus does not fall into our understanding of things. We've talked as a church about Proverbs 16, verse 9. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord determines his steps. I can plan all kinds of things. But that does not mean the Lord is obligated to my plans. And he leads our lives in this world in steps. And we are so much better served to follow with humility than to say, no, 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 God, I've got it figured out. We need to go according to my plan because I've got it figured out. The disciples did not understand what Jesus was talking about. And that's what allowed them to argue who's the greatest. From that, it says, uh, verse 28, You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as the Father conferred one to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, once again, they would not have understood this until later, um, but it has future fulfillment. Uh, from that, then we're going to have the development of what is you know, for us commonly called Good Friday. Jesus is going to go into Gethsemane. Uh, he's going to pray. Uh, the temple guards are going to show up and arrest him. He'll be taken to Caiaphas' house. Uh, he will then in the morning be taken to Pontius Pilate. Uh, he will then suffer at the hands of the Roman guards, not the temple guards, but the Roman guards. There will be a verdict of sentencing him to death, and then the crucifixion will begin. And that's where we're going to finish in this study, is at the crucifixion. And we'll pick that up in our closing talk of, um, of the Gospel of Luke. So getting us to that point, verse 39 through 53, will be in Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus is going to pray very famously, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, not yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appears to him, strengthens him. Being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And uh, what you have there in a medical condition, uh, I believe it's called hematidrosis, uh, where blood capillaries can literally begin to secrete through the sweat glands. Uh, but you have an intensity in prayer on Jesus' behalf. Matthew will tell us that he will pray this, go and find the disciples asleep, ask them to be alert, to be watching. Uh, he'll say, for the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. He'll go away. He'll pray the same thing a second time. And Matthew's the one that includes that he comes back, finds the disciples sleeping, and then goes back and prays it a third time. And so uh, I've leaned very consistently over the years that that faith is not about having to pray something once and being done, but faith is about where you go when you're desperate. If Jesus prayed the same thing three times in that span of time, then if you find yourself praying regularly and consistently about the same thing, that's not an absence of faith. Faith is not about how many times I have to talk to God about Faith is about where do I take this pain or this difficulty, and I want to keep taking it to the Lord. 
We're going to have in verse 40 through 44, intense prayer, the disciples sleeping. Then verse 47 through 48, Jesus will be arrested and the disciples will actually fight back, specifically Peter. Peter will be chastised for it. Uh, but then in verse 54, we're going to watch Peter following uh, the temple guards. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. So uh, if you watch back to Mark 13, going into Mark 14, and then also uh, into Matthew 26, you can watch, um, I, I show maps in those studies of the progression from going from Gethsemane through what's called the Kidron Valley up towards Caiaphas' house. Uh, to where Peter would have followed. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting that he follows at a distance. Uh, that's an interesting uh, thing because uh, in that whole bank of first 54 to 62, we're going to find three things about Peter. We're going to find that he follows at a distance. We're going to find him at a fire. And we're going to find him... Uh, denying at that fire, and then the real famous, uh, the, the, the rooster, the rooster crowing and um, at the time of these three denials. And it's going to say that following this third denial that Jesus is going to look at him. In verse 60, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. I mean, you want to talk about a look that cuts through your soul. You know, if you've denied the Lord and he looks at you, I'm sure he's not looking at him with judgment like you, miserable person. I'm sure he is looking with a, um, a grace, a love, um, not an I told you so, um, but just I... I I think there would have been so much poignancy to that look. Uh, Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Uh, that, that's pretty easy, I think, for most of us to understand uh, because that's probably how we would have responded too. The temple guards are the first to harm Jesus. They're the ones that have grabbed him in uh, the Gethsemane and they are the ones at Caiaphas' house. The temple had guards. Caiaphas' house, make no mistake of this, the geography of it, Caiaphas' house is not at the temple. It's in Jerusalem, but there's it's separated. Uh, you know, I would say 10-minute walk, maybe. You know, we've been there, uh, been in both, been in what is historically known as Caiaphas' house uh, on two occasions, um, and to the Temple Mount, I would say 10, 10 minutes maybe, uh, walk. But the Temple Guards would have also been participant in the arresting of Jesus and then taking him to Caiaphas' house. They would have been the ones who began to beat him first. Uh, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him, demanded prophesy who hit you. They said many other insulting things to him. Inside Caiaphas' house, uh, there's going to be the trial at daybreak. The council, the elders of the law of the people, both the chief priests, teachers of the law met together. And Jesus was led before them. Here, I want you to focus on this. They say, if you are the Christ, tell us. Jesus answered, I tell you, you will not believe. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And they all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. <clears throat> now, here's the challenge for them. They have successfully arrested him, gotten their hands on him, been able to cause suffering and beating upon him without the mob and the people even aware. It's a late night. They've all made preparations for the Passover in their home. No one knows this is going on for the most part. And so they're able to um, convict him. Now understand this. For the temple, they were ruled by the Sadducees. There was also the chief priest. They could execute a judgment upon somebody. They could create a 
guilty verdict upon somebody. However, they could not, the Sadducees and Temple Guard could not put trial towards a Roman citizen and they could not execute someone. So you think, for instance, a Roman citizen. You think over in the book of Acts at the very end how the Apostle Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. And they can't do anything with him. Why? Because he's a Roman citizen. So he's got to go under Roman court, so to say. So he's going to be in, transferred up to Caesarea, which was Roman rule. And then he'll eventually find himself in Rome. The side for Jesus is the Sadducees and the Temple Guard could not execute someone. They had to have Roman authority. They had to have a Roman ruler who would authorize that. That's why they're going to go to Pilate. So let's pick up with this. It's going to go into chapter 23. The religious leaders are going to take Jesus to Pilate. The whole assembly rose, led him off to Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, now watch this. We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, claims to be Christ a king. Pause. First thing they say to Pilate is not, he said he's the Christ. First thing they say, he doesn't pay taxes. Why? Because a Roman ruler would look down upon that very shamefully and maybe execute some form of penalty. They add that he also claims to be a Christ. That's why all the following. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Watch verse 4. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, because this is now morning. There would have been growing, there would have been building of, of the story to the people. Um, I find no basis for a charge against this man, but they insisted he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He start, started in Galilee, has come all the way here. Now pause here. So let's lean on this. Uh, they are saying uh, that he claims to be the Christ. To that, Pilate's kind of kind of shrug. They're going to say that he is a tax evader. For that, Pilate most likely would have scolded. The only thing that causes, they're trying to get a death sentence. So they're going to claim that he is a, an initiator of mob. I'll go back. Look at the red. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. One of the things of Roman rulership for Pilate, he was a governor. He was not top dog. He just wasn't. If you look in the history of Pilate, he was not top dog. He was an appointed man to a location. And his responsibility was peace and taxes. So why do the Pharisees, Sadducees, why do they come to Pilate and, and not just solely anchor on, he claims to be Christ and according to our Torah, he must be executed. He must be stoned to death. Because that doesn't mean anything to Pilate. It matters that he's a tax evader by their accusation, which wasn't true, but that's their accusation. It matters even more if he's a mob initiator. And so they're going to try and get Pilate to execute him on keeping peace. So in uh, verse 6 through 12, Pilate's going to send Jesus to Herod not King Herod. Now this is Herod's sons. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So let me just push on something we've looked at before. So Herod doesn't live in Jerusalem, but he happens to be there. Once again, please don't think King Herod, like Herod the Great. Think the sons of Herod. The sons of Herod, there were four of them, and, uh, and I'll, I'll show you something on a map. So you know Jesus did primarily his ministry in Galilee. When he's coming to Jerusalem, he's going to come down into Perea, across the Jordan. He's going to come down into Jericho and then to Jerusalem. That green and that pink area, that is ruled by Herod Antipas. So these are three of the four sons of Herod the Great. 
Herod Philip ruled that Syria area where you would have Caesarea Philippi. Herod Antipas rules that orange and pink area. He's the one who uh, John the Baptist opposed because Herod Antipas took the wife of his brother and, uh, and John the Baptist said, well, that's wrong. That's sinful before God. And, and, uh, and Herod Antipas has uh, John the Baptist beheaded. Herod Antipas was also against Jesus. And so he is the one that Pilate sends Jesus to go before. Because Herod Antipas rules Galilee area, Jesus is from the Galilean area, so he's sending him to Herod for some kind of uh, ruler or ruling. But Herod's going to send him back. It says, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one inciting the people to rebellion. That's what you said. I've examined him in your presence, found no basis for your charges against him. I don't see what you're saying. I don't find that to be true. And neither has Herod. It's interesting that Herod doesn't either. For he sent him back to us, as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. So that I appease you and the mob you're trying to stir up, I'll punish him and then release him. Now, keep in mind something. What was Jewish eschatology? It was that people suffer, Jewish, the Jews suffer, Messiah appears, he uh, eliminates their suffering and those causing the suffering, and then he establishes rulership. What the Pharisees, Sadducees, religious experts of the law began to do, they had to have done this, is they turn the mob to point to he is not the Messiah, he is not going to establish the rulership. In their minds, they would have thought somehow they've been bamboozled. He is not the Messiah after all. And so it says in verse 18, with one voice, they cried out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder, wanting to release Jesus. Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, they don't need to be right. They just need to be a mob. They need to be like uncontrollable. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because Pilate isn't afraid of their testimony. He's afraid of their chaos. For the third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I find in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I'll have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. Once again, you look at the storyline, you look at the Jewish eschatology, you look at what the powers and the limitations of the Sadducees, Pharisees, chief priests, religious leaders, the limitations of them, how they are under the authority of Roman rule and the Roman governor who simply wants people to pay their taxes and keep the peace so he looks good to the Roman heads back in Rome. And it says, so Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Why? Because he just didn't have the backbone to stand against them. Now, from that, we know that Jesus is then going to be in the hands of the Roman guards, and that's different than the temple guards, and the Roman guards are going to flog him. There will be a sentencing to death, and then he will carry his cross to Golgotha. Now, in our last study next week, we're going to take the remainder of Luke chapter 23, take it all the way to resurrection, and then how the book of Luke concludes. So with that, I hope that's maybe been a little bit of a helpful study as uh, we have finished uh, chapter uh, 21, 22, and uh, dipped into chapter 23. And I hope you'll be able to join us for our concluding study of the Gospel of Luke. God bless you, and I'll see you soon.